Hello, I'm Oliver Conway. This edition is published in the early hours of Sunday, the 23rd of July. There have been big demonstrations outside the Israeli parliament over government plans to curb the power of the courts. Russia says Ukraine has attacked an ammunition dump in occupied Crimea. And new details from the Indian state of Manipur about brutal attacks on ethnic minority women during sectarian unrest in May. Also in the podcast... We had a national alert saying the area was being evacuated. We had people sort of running past on the road. Hundreds of people filing down to the beach, asking for water, wet towels. Thousands of people are evacuated from beaches on the Greek island of Rhodes as wildfires destroy hotels. And a new museum in Italy devoted to Enrico Caruso, one of the greatest opera singers of all time. Tens of thousands of Israelis have arrived in Jerusalem to protest over Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's plans to curb the power of the judges. Many of the demonstrators had set off from Tel Aviv on Tuesday, and by Saturday the numbers marching had swelled to around 100,000. As they moved along the main highway in Jerusalem, many waved Israeli flags and blew horns. The hard-right government, which took power late last year, insists it needs to reform the legal system to prevent the courts overruling elected politicians. But the move has sparked a huge backlash, with opponents describing it as a power grab. They are now rallying around Parliament, the Knesset, ahead of a debate on Sunday and vote on Monday on the first part of the government reforms. I'm here because I'm protesting. Our government is stealing our democracy. So we are here to show our voice and to do whatever we can. I have to do something. I can't be at the beach right now. I do what I can. Too much lie, continuously lying to the world, to the public, to the people of Israel. And people understand that all over the country. As well as the rally in Jerusalem, there was a huge protest in Tel Aviv and at least three other cities. With the latest on the deepening divisions in Israeli society, we heard from our Middle East editor, Sebastian Usher. This is now the 29th week of these protests against the planned judicial overhaul. Estimates I've seen of around 200,000 people in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv and in many other locations around the country. The figures normally are a little bit lower than that. I think the extra amount is partly there was this march which has been heading to the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, for the past few days. That added people all through the day today, despite the searing summer heat. So the momentum has been really building up. And this is very much because this is a crunch moment now. The Knesset is due to begin a debate on Sunday, which will lead to the final votes on Monday, the second and third vote for the first bill of this judicial overhaul, one of the most contentious, which essentially means that if it went through, the Supreme Court would lose its power to strike out decisions made by the government, which it has deemed unreasonable. This is a very big moment. The protesters are very much talking about it as their last stand to save Israeli democracy. According to them, as far as the government and its supporters are concerned, they believe that they are giving more democracy back by changing the balance of power between the government and the judiciary, which Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister's government, believes is too weighted towards the judiciary at the moment, which they regard as an elite that doesn't follow the will of the people. Our Middle East regional editor, Sebastian Asha. And as we record this podcast, we're actually getting some breaking news from Israel. In a video statement released late on Saturday night, Benjamin Netanyahu says he will undergo immediate surgery to receive a heart pacemaker. Last weekend, the 73-year-old Prime Minister was taken to hospital with dizziness and dehydration after spending the day in the sun. But he was released on Sunday morning, apparently in excellent health condition, according to the hospital's head of cardiology. In his video message, Mr Netanyahu said, A week ago I was fitted with a monitoring device. That device beat this evening and said I must have a pacemaker and that I must do it already tonight. I feel great, but I need to listen to my doctors. The Justice Minister Yariv Levin will serve as acting Israeli Prime Minister during the surgery. The Jerusalem Post is reporting that Mr Netanyahu is expected to return to the Knesset in time for the vote on the reform bill, which is likely to be on Monday afternoon. 
Speaking to a US security forum on Friday, President Zelensky reiterated Ukraine's goal of retaking all occupied territory from Russia, and that includes Crimea. The peninsula was annexed by Russia nine years ago, and winning it back would be a huge challenge for the Ukrainians. But that hasn't stopped them attacking Russian forces there. On Saturday, Ukraine said it attacked military infrastructure in Crimea as drones hit an ammunition depot. I asked our Europe regional editor, Danny Eberhard, what more was known about the attack. Well, this place is in the centre of the Crimean Peninsula. It's on an important route up from the south, from Sevastopol. What you see in video footage of the incident are huge plumes of smoke and also the sound of explosions, which would, of course, tally with the report from the governor that an ammunition dump was hit. The Ukrainian military also published video of the incident. It didn't claim responsibility for the attack, but it said ammunition warehouses and oil depots were hit. Some of the smoke you see is very dark, so again, that sort of tallies with what we can see. The proxy governor of Crimea, Sergei Aksyonov, said that he's evacuated areas with the radius of five kilometres around the site. And this is something that happened similarly a couple of days ago when a different ammunition dump was hit in a different part of Crimea, closer to the Kerch Bridge. That's the key bridge linking Russia to occupied Crimea. And earlier, we also saw disruption of the road traffic across that bridge. It was temporarily blocked and there were big queues that formed on either the side and Sergei Aksyonov also suspended rail traffic in the Crimean Peninsula. Now, could Ukraine realistically take back Crimea? And if not, what's the rationale for these uh, attacks on the area? Well, Russia's annexed it in 2014. It's had a long time to build up significant military infrastructure there. It's also the site of the main Black Sea naval base at Sevastopol. So there would be a, a, a huge challenge to do it. Ukraine says that is its aim. Crimea is an area which uh, Vladimir Putin has invested enormous personal prestige in retaking that area, um, which was originally given to Ukraine in Soviet times. If the long-term aim is to try to liberate the peninsula, the short short-term aim with some of these attacks is to hit Russian supply lines. Targets like the bridge, which it sees very much as a military target and an illegally built bridge, oil depots, ammunition dumps, other bridges as well. The main reasons for this is because Ukraine is mounting its own counter-offensive in areas like Zaporizhia in the south, trying to push south. So anything that would Im impede Russia's military reprovisioning through Crimea would be of great assistance in that campaign. Our Europe regional editor, Danny Eberhardt. Graphic accounts are emerging of further atrocities in the northeast Indian state of Manipur during an outbreak of ethnic violence in May. There's already been national outrage at a video showing two women from the minority Christian Kuki community being paraded naked and assaulted by a mob. Charles Haviland has the details and a warning some listeners may find parts of his report distressing. Manipur's current conflict pits the majority Meite people, who are mostly Hindu, against the tribal minority Kuki, the bulk of whom are Christians. In early May, Kuki people demonstrated against government plans to extend tribal status and associated privileges to the Meite. New evidence keeps emerging about the brutal violence that followed, mostly, it seems, perpetrated by Meite mobs against Kuki victims. In the most publicised case to date, a violent mob snatched two men and three women, killed the men and paraded and sexually assaulted the women. The ordeal of two of them was filmed. Several incidents have now come to light from the area around the Manipur state capital, Impal. A Christian pastor described finding the half-burnt and naked body of a kooky woman who failed to escape a mob on the rampage. Elsewhere, a woman has spoken of her cousin and another woman being hunted down at a car wash by a massive crowd letting out war cries, as she put it, and raped and murdered. The police have been slow to act. According to the campaign group Human Rights Watch, this is despite their having witnessed some of the violence. There's also widespread anger that it was only on Thursday that India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi commented publicly on the violence in Manipur, which is governed by his own Bharatiya Janata Party. He called it a disgrace for the entire country. Human Rights Watch said it should not have taken video evidence for Indian authorities to acknowledge what it called these horrific abuses. Charles Haviland reporting. The daughter of a German-Iranian engineer fears her father could be executed by the authorities in Iran at any moment. 
Jamshid Shahmad was sentenced to death in February for so-called corruption on earth, a term the Iranian regime uses to condemn dissidents. Amnesty International says it was a sham trial. A few days ago, his daughter Gazelle was unexpectedly allowed to talk to him on the phone for the first time in two years. She fears it was a goodbye call before an execution. This report from Berlin by Damien McGuinness. A court in Iran has sentenced a German-Iranian dissident to death on the charge of corruption on earth. Jamshid Shahmad, he's a 68-year-old Iranian-German engineer who was abducted three years ago in Dubai while on a business trip and taken to an Iranian jail. In February, he was sentenced to death for so-called corruption on earth, a vague catch-all term for anything the Iranian regime doesn't like. He lost his teeth, so he can't eat because he has no teeth anymore. Speaking from her home in the US, his daughter, Gazelle Sharmad, told me he is clearly being tortured. He can't walk, he can't talk because they don't give him his medication on time. He's a Parkinson's patient that needs his medication every three hours. To a few days before our conversation, Gazelle was unexpectedly allowed to speak to her father on the phone. He's been in solitary confinement for almost three years now, and he hadn't even been told about the death sentence. Killing him softly in this death cell, but even if he survives that, they're killing him by hanging him from a crane in public to send out this message of terror that anybody who speaks out against the regime, we can do this to you. Look at this person that's hanging here. Gazelle has now launched a criminal complaint here in Germany, calling on German state prosecutors to investigate Iranian officials for crimes against humanity under the principle of universal jurisdiction. Patrick Korker is Gazelle's German lawyer. If it's an international crime, crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide then any country in the world can investigate and prosecute. Patrick and the human rights organisation he works for, ECCHR, used this principle last year to prosecute crimes committed in Syria. Here at Berlin's Brandenburg Gate, at an Iranian opposition protest with plenty of Iranian music, I've just met Alina. She's an Iranian German who's outraged by the lack of political support for Jamshid Sharmad. She says that leaves her also feeling vulnerable. I feel very disappointed by Germany because if this would be me, I know that my country doesn't have my back. Some suspect racism, asking if Mr. Sharmad is not seen as a real German. Others say Berlin prioritizes trade over human rights. When I put those allegations to the government, the German Foreign Office responded that Berlin was doing everything in its power to help Mr. Sharmad and that the death sentence was a massive violation of the rights of a German citizen. Either way, many Iranian Germans feel persecuted by Iran but forgotten by Germany. Damien McGuinness in Berlin. Georgetown University in Washington is a prestigious centre of learning, with former US President Bill Clinton just one of its many illustrious alumni. But back in 1838, financial mismanagement and overambitious building projects left it deep in debt. So it dug itself out of a hole by selling 272 enslaved people on plantations owned by the Catholic Church in the nearby state of Maryland. The slave owners were Jesuit priests. That murky tale has been explored in a book by Rachel Swarns called The 272. She's been speaking to Audrey Brown. A colleague of mine at the New York Times received an email from a CEO of a tech company who was pitching her on a story about a slave sale in 1838 that had benefited Georgetown University, one of America's elite universities. And I had written a book about Michelle Obama, United States' first African-American first lady, and her enslaved ancestors. And so she sent that email on to me. And I read it and knew immediately that it was a story. Let's talk about the title, The 272. I like to take folks back to November of 1838 to the docks. And if you had been standing there, you would have seen them. Scores of people being loaded onto a ship, forcibly loaded. There were elderly people, husbands and wives, children, babies, people falling to their knees, begging for mercy. And they were enslaved African-Americans who had been sold and were being shipped 
the deep south, far from the world they knew and the people they loved. And they had been owned and enslaved and sold by some of the nation's most prominent Catholic priests, who happened to be among the largest slaveholders in the state of Maryland. And when tough times came, these priests did what a lot of people did, which was to sell off their assets. And they were sold to save the Jesuit priest's most prized mission project, the university we now know as Georgetown. The fact they were Jesuits and the Catholic Church shouldn't be a surprise, right? But I imagine that lots of people will be surprised. It shouldn't be a surprise, but it is not at all common knowledge. Historians are familiar with this history, but most Americans, most Catholics are not. I certainly was not, and I was astounded, frankly. I happen to be Black and Catholic myself, and I I had no idea. How did Georgetown react to this? Because obviously they must have known. Absolutely. Before I started writing about it in 2015, they decided that they needed to look into this history more deeply and to grapple with it. And since then, they have taken a number of steps. They have created what they call a reconciliation fund of committing to raising $400,000 a year that would fund projects to benefit descendants. And the first rounds of those grants were just released this spring. The Jesuits partnered with a group of descendants to create a foundation. They've committed to raising $100 million. It's the largest effort by the Roman Catholic Church to try to address the history of Catholic slaveholding in the United States. But fundraising has been slow going. And both institutions have apologized too. And just out of interest, the Catholics around you at Mass, what have they said? about this. There are a lot of Catholics who just stunned and say, you know, my goodness, I never knew. We need to know. And then there are others who say, oh, can't you stop already? That's so long ago. It's nothing to do with me. And I try to tell people that it has everything to do with all of us now. This history is tied to so many of the contemporary institutions around us. Banks, life insurance companies, municipalities, the state of California is wrestling with the issue of reparations. It's all of our history. We can't afford to look away. The author of The 272, Rachel Swans, talking to Audrey Brown. Still to come on the Global News Podcast. Chewing gum has not recovered from the pandemic. People are not going back to the office at the same levels. And with this expectation that you're going to be exposed to all these co-workers, you want your breath to smell good, <laughs> that's not happening anymore. Why the world is no longer quite so into chewing gum. Officials on the Greek island of Rhodes say up to 30,000 people have been moved to safety because of the threat of wildfires. Some had to be ferried from beaches by the Coast Guard and even private boats. Videos also showed crowds of tourists fleeing by foot with flames and billowing black smoke in the distance. Greece is 11 days into a heat wave. Forecasters warn it could last for up to 17 days. Azadeh Mashiri reports from Greece. Helicopters flying over the beaches and into the thick smoke. Large crowds of tourists have fled their resorts and locals their own villages as the blaze engulfed parts of the island. Rhodes has been burning for five days and the flames are said to be out of control. Officials say they have moved thousands threatened by the wildfires to gyms, schools and hotel conference centres to stay overnight. Where the flames cut off road access, some tourists walked to safety. When the evacuation alerts sounded this afternoon, tourists headed for the beach, pulling their suitcases behind them. Around 2,000 were rescued by water. Katie Piercefield Holmes is one of the tourists who was affected. We had a national alert saying the area was being evacuated, but we were being told that our hotel wasn't. We locked ourselves up in our room. We had people sort of running past on the road, hundreds of people filing down to the beach, asking for water, wet towels. Emergency services have also been battling wildfires across Greece. Other countries have sent planes and firefighters to help. Airlines have warned customers to follow advice from local authorities and said they are monitoring the situation. But for tourists and locals already facing the flames, the only option is to seek shelter, then evacuate. 
Azadeh Mashiri in Greece. Well, the extreme heat waves in Europe, the US and China are likely to have a big impact on the global economy. One study suggests that $100 billion worth of worker productivity was lost in the year 2020 because of higher than usual temperatures. That analysis was carried out by Cathy Boffman McLeod, director of the Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center in Washington. She spoke to Rob Young about the financial impact of extreme weather. Climate-driven extreme heat and these massive heat waves that we are experiencing, they drain economic activity. And that starts with the way heat hits the human body. Workers, when they are hot and get sick and don't rest at night, they come to work tired, they make mistakes, our hand-eye coordination is off, and the economy loses money because everything is slowed down. Think about heat as quietly and invisibly draining our economy. Workers outside, workers in delivery trucks that are not air conditioned, workers in unair conditioned warehouses, lots of workers around the world doing IT work and back office work in places that are not air conditioned and going home to places also not air conditioned, roasting in the day and roasting at night. And that's really taking a hit to our economy. If there is a period of a very extreme temperature and an employer on a construction site when a farm says it's just too hot for my workers to work for the next few days, for example, the chances are they're paid a day rate and therefore they don't earn any money. So those workers may well want to continue working even though the heat is extreme. Do we therefore perhaps need to look at the way people are employed, where often it is contract or day work? You are spot on. We do need to look at how we equitably protect people from heat. And when people get paid by the carton of fruit that they pick or by the hour, and in Qatar right now, they have a law that has them not working for several weeks when it's deadly hot outside. And so we will be changing the flow and the timing and the scheduling of our economy. We will have to to accommodate this heat. And I think we might be looking at instead of a sick day, you have a heat day and there'll be more economic analysis coming that tells us it saves money to protect workers versus fighting against regulations to protect workers, thinking that it's too costly. And there are day policies in Japan for heat that you can buy on the spot. And so I think we'll see some development of new approaches on insurance. At Arstrock, we are experimenting with a parametric insurance policy for women in the informal sector in India who, when it's too hot to work, they get paid to their bank account to not work, to save their health. And I think business interruption is one of the biggest areas areas and insurance that will develop because restaurants close, metro systems are closing down and the airports, tarmac is buckling and the planes don't fly at a certain level. And so when our systems are interrupted that way, who pays for that and how do we account for it? Kathy Boffman McLeod, director of the Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Centre in Washington. The head of the military junta in Mali has brought in a new constitution for the West African nation. It gives the office of president new powers and enhances the status of the armed forces. It also creates a Senate and demotes French from an official to a working language. The opposition has denounced the reforms. Julian Bedford reports. The new constitution was given the overwhelming backing of Malians in a referendum, albeit one that few voted on. The head of the military government, Colonel Asimi Goita, says it's needed to better combat the Islamist insurgency that has riven the country for the past decade. But like other recent moves, including the expulsion of French and UN peacekeeping forces, it also cedes more power to Colonel Goita, who in the two years he's led the country, has done little to drive back the jihadists. Julian Bedford. A music festival in Malaysia has been halted after the lead singer of the British band The 1975, Matty Healy, kissed his bassist, Ross MacDonald, in a protest over Malaysian laws against homosexuality. Healy was escorted off stage before the organisers announced that the rest of the event in the capital Kuala Lumpur would be cancelled. With more on the story, here's Catherine Cracknell. During the band's set, Matty Healy launched into a tirade against the country's strict laws banning homosexuality. He said agreeing to play at the festival had been a mistake and he hadn't done enough research about Malaysia. I did not see the point of inviting the 1975 to a country 
and then telling us who we can have sex with. He then kissed the bass player, Ross MacDonald, before the band were ordered off stage. Malaysia's communications minister demanded an explanation from the festival organisers and ordered the rest of the event to be cancelled, calling the kiss a very disrespectful act. The festival's organisers were also unhappy. Juan Allman is the director of entertainment at Future Sound Asia. I think it's very easy for him to fly in and do whatever he thinks he wants to do and then just fly out without having to face or taking accountability for any consequences for his actions. Matty Healy is a long-standing champion of the LGBTQ plus community and this isn't the first time he's kissed a man on stage in controversial circumstances. In Dubai in 2019, he kissed a male fan to protest against anti-homosexuality laws there, almost getting himself arrested. Catherine Cracknell. According to recent data, we may have fallen out of love with chewing gum. Consumer research firm Sakana says gum sales around the world have plummeted by nearly a third since 2018. So what's going on? Michael Waters, a reporter for The Atlantic magazine, has been investigating and has, excuse the pun, been chewing over his findings with Evan Davis. Chewing gum has quietly disappeared from the cultural mainstream, especially over the last couple decades. And there are a bunch of different factors that I think are influencing that, from the decline in prominence of chewing gum in pop culture to this general shift towards e-commerce, which has really left behind these tiny purchases like gum that you buy when you're at a store. And then chewing gum has not recovered from the pandemic. People are not going back to the office at the same levels. And so on your morning commute, if you used to chew gum with this expectation that you're going to be exposed to all these co-workers, you know, you want your breath to smell good. <laughs> That's not happening anymore to the same extent. But in the article, you trace through how it's used in Hollywood, the sexual role of being seen chewing gum, the rebelliousness that you might see. And talk us through that one, uh, Michael. In the context of the Aztecs, for instance, chewing gum was really associated with sexuality, especially sex work, especially among women. And I think you see versions of that repeated into the 20th century, into the Hollywood story. I talked to some experts who speculated it's truly just about mouth movements and something suggestive in that. Um, but this is an interestingly repeated phenomenon throughout different cultures over the last several centuries where chewing gum is really associated with this sense of edge and the sense of sexuality. Double your pleasure, double your fun with double good, double good, double mint gum. And especially in the U.S., when Wrigley was first taking off, its marketing really played on that. And so you see Wrigley marketing in women's magazines and often like referencing in sneaky ways in the 1920s and 30s sexuality. And that was sort of how gum was marketed and that was how it was perceived. And by the 1950s, what you start to see is that Hollywood seizes on that. And chewing gum for a time becomes really associated with Marlon Brando. A lot of his characters are seen chewing gum and he himself became famous for chewing gum on sets. And you see that repeated throughout the 20th century when you get to movies like Grease, for instance, where basically everyone is chewing gum all the time in addition to smoking cigarettes. Baby, don't blow it. Don't put my good advice. And so chewing gum, where it was once associated with this like dirty sexuality in the early 20th century, it becomes reclaimed by the middle of the 20th century, especially among young people who see it as that they can chew gum at school and it's like against the rules and it's rebelling to some extent against sort of authority. There is just a larger celebration of difference and edge among young people today. And so I think there's no longer this universal archetype of what edge means among young people today. Atlantic magazine reporter Michael Waters. More than 100 years after he died, Enrico Caruso is still celebrated as one of opera's greatest singers, a man with a, quote, magical voice. He's been honoured in the Italian city of his birth, Naples, with a museum that's just opened. Daniel Mann reports on his extraordinary talent. <laughs> Enrico Caruso, who became the first singer to sell a million records. When the American soprano Geraldine Farrar stood on stage with him, she forgot to sing. Her reason? She had broken into tears hearing the beauty of Caruso's voice. 
Vesti La Juba from Pagliacci is one of opera's best-loved arias, and Caruso's performance as Canio the Clown became his most famous role. A white costume he wore is one of the many exhibits in Museo Caruso in Naples, which has opened 150 years after he was born there. Laura Valenti is the museum's curator.